All right. Yeah. Can get underway. Um, thanks everybody for coming out. Um, for those of you who have not been to one of these before, this is part of our uh, Mary Teft White Cultural Center Talking in the Library series, um, a series that was funded by an alumna from the university, Mary Teft White, with the idea that we would have uh, speakers from outside the campus community coming in, sharing their experiences, um, sharing their knowledge, and hopefully inspiring people um, to um, other things in their life and to consider other, other worlds outside their own world. So, histories are written by the colonizers, or so we often hear, by the victors, a form of propaganda that often validates the assuming and consuming of a land and a culture, validating its aggression and justifying it, but also while developing one new historical narrative, it eradicates another, often a complete past lost to future generations. Sometimes this is, this is done after the fact, and sometimes, as I suspect we might hear today, it is part of a larger contemporaneous strategy, not so much a revision of history, but a rewriting of it that also intends to write the future. Through the Talking in the Library series, this term we have been focusing on propaganda and mis and dis disinformation, as we have in the first year seminar. It is hard not to think about the calculated dismantling and reconstruction of one's own story by another person or state as being among the most heinous use of such tactics. Ones that in the end tell you that not only do you no longer exist, but that you never have existed. We are fortunate to have Liz Shepnolitkova here this afternoon to talk about how this is taking place in real time in Ukraine by the Russian propagandists. Liz is a longstanding civil society activist and researcher of higher education in Ukraine. Her research interests have focused on the academic profession in the post-Soviet state, a place where she has had long involvement beginning in 2008 as a student activist, later serving as one of the authors of the Ukrainian Higher Education Act, a consultant a consultant to various organizations on issues of educational reforms in Ukraine, and as an evaluator for applicants for the Fulbright Program and Worldwide Studies Program in Ukraine. In 2014, after the Russian attacks on Crimea, Liz became involved with scholars at risk, helping to monitor attacks in higher education and academic freedom in the region. Liz was in Ukraine when the war broke out, but able to leave in its early days and thankfully she and her husband are safe here in the US where they currently live in St. Louis, something we may also learn more about. But the focus for today, uh, Liz's talk, is the study of the challenges experienced by Ukrainian historians amid Russia's deliberate efforts to recast Ukrainian history, culture, and identity to meet its political objectives and ambitions. And parenthetically, as Liz speaks, uh, I would encourage you to think of questions you might have, as we will have time in the end for Q&A. So please welcome Liz Shekhalikova. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for having me and for your kind introduction. Um, I'm going to hope to make it engaging. <laughs> Um, although uh, maybe not necessarily uh, a very familiar topic for many of you. Um, I'm going to start by just telling you a little bit about myself. Uh, as Adam mentioned, I am Ukrainian, um, as my whole family is. Um, and um, I've been working on interviewing some of the Ukrainian historians um, as a part of my larger research project, which was very generously supported by the Ukrainian Educational Research Association. Um, and at this time, particularly for Ukraine, um, this work uh, is very enlightening uh, because of many things that our country is going through. Um, I've heard from Adam that some of you have been doing 
some of the digging about Ukraine and some presentations as a part of your assignments. I was wondering if anybody would be courageous enough to share just maybe one fact that you've learned that you thought was interesting, strange, surprising, anything that kind of caught your mind. Yay, a hand over there. Mm -hmm. um, the Orange Revolution protests and how that got like the citizens they wanted, but then later on that same president they fought for ended up kind of doing the opposite. And mm -hmm. like how you end up having to think. Okay, great. So what was very surprising to me was how dumb is it from financial perspective, the starving of Ukrainian mm -hmm. Stalin. The Mm -hmm. It was such a tragedy. Yeah, all of them were. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay. Well, thank you very much for sharing. Uh, um, yes. Go ahead. That this um, supposed to happen over like a hundred years after the creation. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you're right. Hundred years after. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the war didn't technically start. The actual invasion started. The war has been going on for a few years. This sort of has been, it just sort of gained more uh, traction and attention in the past uh, little while. Absolutely. You're absolutely correct. Thank you very much for sharing, you all. We're going to talk about how the war started and the Orange Revolution and the topics such as Voldemort are very important parts of the conversation today, that we are having today. So I'm very delighted that that as something that, you know, um, kind of sparked your attention. I hope that's going to help keep you engaged. So um, I wanted to start by telling you a little bit more about my background. Uh, you can see right there on the map, the regular Google Maps screenshot, a little pin. That pin is located in a town called Starobysk. This is where I was born and raised. Um, it's, you know, give or take. 40, 50 miles, something like that from the Russian border. Um, and as you can see on the map to your right, it is now occupied by the Russian troops. Um, it's very interesting because when I see Russian news or read you know, the statements by Russian president, um, what I hear is I hear what they think about me. They think that because I speak Russian, as well as Ukrainian and English, I need to be protected from someone. They think that, you know, obviously, I just don't know, but I'm not real Ukrainian, I'm Russian in my identity. Um, and oftentimes what we can hear is that everything that is happening in Ukraine is a proxy war, or Ukraine is a false state created by the West. Ukrainian government doesn't really make any decisions. So when what I hear, I hear is that I have no agency. I hear that I don't influence anything. It's somebody in Washington and somebody else in Moscow who's gonna decide who I am, what I am, where I come from and where I'm going. As you could imagine, that is not really the story that I want to hear. I don't want any of this to be a story of my life. Because as Adam mentioned, um, I was in Ukraine, for example, in 2014. I was on Euromaidan. I was organizing protests. I was working with other people who were there. And we were all convinced that we have agency. <laughs> We were all 100% convinced that we can decide where Ukraine is going as a state. Um, and then, of course, you know, um, when Russians have uh, invaded Crimea and uh, Donetsk and Luhansk region of Ukraine, we were told that we don't, right? Um, so for many of us, you know, Russian disinformation and Russian propaganda um, is really not just about the propaganda overall, but oftentimes about our own identities. 
because I honestly just don't think that speaking Russian makes me Russian, just like I don't think that speaking English makes me English. <laughs> um, and um, when we think about why, you know, these narratives are coming up again and again, um, it is very important to understand that although nowadays we probably talk about disinformation and propaganda more than we have ever talked about it in this century at least, it hasn't been invented in this century. This information has been very consistently applied by the Soviet Union in particular for a variety of reasons. And as I hope you will see throughout this presentation, um, what we are dealing with today is really a continuity of the events that have taken place, as you rightfully mentioned, um, or started taking place over a hundred years ago, right? So I think that in order to kind of set the scene, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about this legacies of what I call Sovietization. And what I mean by Sovietization is I mean a bunch of different processes that have taken place after 1922, when the Soviet Union first occupied the territory of Ukraine. Because as you rightfully mentioned, you know, 1918, Ukraine has declared independence from the Russian Empire, was called Ukrainian People's Republic at the time. Um, but it had very little capacity internally and very little support externally to be able to um, really protect its independence in a way. Uh, and uh, when the Soviet troops have taken over Ukraine, uh, there were a lot of very interesting changes that had to happen in order for the Soviet Union to maintain its power over Ukrainian territory. I'm not saying that this is 100% unique to Ukraine. Don't think me, don't think me wrong. A lot of these things have been happening in many other places, such as, for example, Baltic states after the Second World War uh, or Central Asian states. But I, I'm just more familiar with the Ukrainian context, so I'm going to be focusing on this. Um, and the first thing to begin with, uh, which provides us a very obvious example, you know, how um, what we see right now is a continuity of what has started 100 years ago, is a, this way that disinformation plays into justification of aggression. And um, the way that this has been instrumentalized, for example, last century was um, by Stalin to justify invasion of Poland. So some of you may know from your history lesson, in 1939, Stalin and Hitler signed a pact well, it was Molotov and Ribbentrop who signed the pact on behalf of Stalin and Hitler, to be clear. Um, but their idea was basically that they're going to split Poland between the Soviet Union and Germany. And the way that Stalin has justified taking over Eastern Poland was by stating that this is not really Eastern Poland. Don't really believe that. This is Western Ukraine. So we're going to reunify Western Ukraine with Eastern Ukraine. And that was the justification for the Soviet troops to come into uh, what was uh, called Lvov at the time and other cities, which is oftentimes now part of Western Ukraine. Uh, there were many various you know, cases like this throughout history. This is just one of the most obvious parallels that we can make between what is happening nowadays in Ukraine when uh, Russian leadership is saying that they're reunifying, you know, the Russian speaking population with other Russian speaking populations. Um, and this is obviously not a new tactic. But um, the way to make this disinformation realistic is not just through the invention of these narratives. There's really a very kind of fascinating and complex uh, dynamics behind how this uh, like people and institutions are being transformed in order for this kind of disinformation to work. And one of the way that the Soviets have done it was through the 
this thing we call binary thinking in academia. I'm sorry if I will get too technical. If I get too technical, you let me know, okay? But basically, what does binary thinking mean? It's very easy. Just see the world in black and white. There's no such thing as, you know, truth and half truth and quarter of the truth. The idea of the Soviet Union was that there's socialist scholarship and there's capitalist scholarship. So if you are producing your scholarship in Moscow or St. Petersburg or Kiev, and you're a communist, then your scholarship is superior because it's socialist. And if you're producing your scholarship somewhere else, um, in Paris or, you know, um, uh, some other place around the world, which is not communist, but which is capitalist, then your scholarship is inferior because it's just capitalist scholarship. What that creates, that creates this very uh, fascinating phenomenon when scholarship is judged not on the, based on the quality of your argument, but based on the ideological affiliation. And that automatically provides justification for censorship because that means, you know, that if one scholarship is inferior to the other, then whichever is superior can ignore whatever is inferior, right? So, for example, in the Soviet Union, um, many of the Ukrainian scholars have not have access to uh, any Western kind of publications scholarly, but also even to pre-Soviet Ukrainian publications. So a lot of those uh, academic works have been taken to the archives in Moscow and Leningrad at the time. And in order to get access to them, you had to get an approval from a Politburo of the Communist Party. And that would not, <laughs> of course, be very easy to do, right? But the other thing that it also influences is the way that we ourselves think and the way that we ourselves frame our arguments, right? Because self-censorship is a very big part of how the system is being maintained. So if you're functioning within this binary logic of socialist versus communist, black versus white, then you don't really want to use the arguments of the opposite side unless you want to criticize them. That was one of the ways in the Soviet Union you could get access to Western scholarship if you were really good at criticizing Western scholarship. Um, and you could write a real thick book on how somebody's capitalist scholarship is inferior. <laughs> um, so it creates certain thinking patterns, right? It creates this kind of... Uh, environment where you're constantly functioning within the dichotomy, where you're constantly juxtapositioning things, you're constantly thinking in binary terms. And in that environment, it's very hard to imagine, you know, the shades of gray in between the different radical sides. Um, but then, of course, there are people who do not engage properly with that system. So in Ukraine, we had thousands of intellectuals purged, for example. Some people have been um, sent out of the country. Some people have been murdered. Um, and unfortunately, one of the things that people don't often talk about is that much of that has been possible because of the collaboration of other scholars with the communist regime. Oftentimes, especially um, in the 1930s, the way that purges have been happening was through some folks in the lower rank of academic profession wanting to make a career reporting on their supervisors or you know, on their senior colleagues um, as, uh, as this, there was this very special Soviet term, bourgeois nationalists. So that's a very dangerous term to be called in the Soviet Union. And then those people would you know, um, be purged and their positions would get open. But, um, what those collaborators have not foreseen is that oftentimes those positions would not necessarily be taken by other scholars. Oftentimes, those positions could be taken by politically appropriate appointees, which essentially means that particularly in history, a lot of folks who came into academic profession, who became historians in the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic, 
were not trained historians. They could have been absolutely fantastic, you know, communist party members. They could have been great workers on the um, collective farm and getting a chance to become an academic, getting into academic training was a reward for their political loyalty. And what that does, that creates an absolutely different system of incentives. When you come here to a university, you're probably used to your professors doing a lot of, you know, prior work in order to become experts in their fields. And when they come to class to you, you know that you can rely on what they know because they've done a lot of their personal research in order to teach you. Well, that is not the case when we talk about the former Soviet states. And um, this is very important because um, I'm just going to give you a hint of what's to come next. Um, those people who've been trained in the Soviet system, uh, most of the time have never left the academic profession after the Soviet Union collapsed. Uh, the other couple of things, you know, that are important to remember here is also that um, communism, uh, and especially the way it was implemented in the Soviet Union, is very much about the collective and not about an individual. What that means is that there were whole systems created such as, you know, um, organizations of scholars that functioned in order to collectively suppress individual agency. Um, imagine you're in a class. Uh, imagine you were told that um, if somebody cheats in your class, you're all gonna be held responsible. Obviously, you wouldn't want anybody to cheat, right? You don't wanna bear anybody's any responsibility for anybody else's mistake. Well, that could be flipped in order to support political system. Basically, what collectives did in the Soviet Union, they ensured that if somebody steps out of the line, everybody who is in the same organization bears responsibility. So that way, peers, are you also your censors? Peers are also, um, you know, people who control you. Uh, you don't really have peers as your colleagues or peers as your potential partners. Um, and uh, after the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, the question that was on everybody's mind is, if Ukraine is no longer a communist, if Ukraine is no longer totalitarian, then how does the state go about regulating or doing anything really about academic freedom? And uh, I have liberated here in, uh, you know, uh, in quotes because uh, what happened really was not that much of a liberation per se. Uh, what happened was that uh, Nobody just knew what to do next. And when uh, people don't know what to do next, uh, people tend to do exactly you know, the opposite of what they used to do or continue doing exactly the same which they used to do, right? Um, and this is what kind of happened in Ukraine. And this is why, um, you know, um, the... Ukrainian kind of context seems so um, weird, right? We do a revolution once, we get a president, and then uh, turns out we don't like him anymore. <laughs> and we elect, you know, his opponent four years later. Um, so in Ukrainian context, um, formally there was no ideology. Formally, you know, the state was just a regular secular state, but uh, the government said, we got to build the state. So scholars should help us build the state. Guess what that means? That means that from one opposite, communism, people switch to a different opposite, ethno-nationalism, right? We're not a communist state anymore. We're a nation state now. So in history, that has translated into people starting uh, to uh, rebrand themselves. Uh, somebody who yesterday was a researcher of the history of the Communist Party, today became the researcher of the history of Ukraine. 
a department that yesterday was a department of scientific materialism. I have no idea what that thing is, guys. I'm just as confused as you are. Um, today, they're teaching world history or something along those lines, right? So names have changed very fast. But as you can imagine, changing content is not as easy as changing the name. Um, and changing content is what uh, scholars often talk about as deconstructing Soviet history or deconstructing Soviet legacy. Um, I have a great quote here. This is exactly talking about Holodomor that we had mentioned before, right? Uh, this is from one of my interviews. A person who in the 1988 year published a book called uh, Socialist Way of Life of the Ukrainian Soviet Peasantry and wrote that in 1932 and 1933 academic years, 96% of peasants and peasant children went to school this is exactly the years when over 4 million Ukrainians started hunger. Imagine somebody wrote that 96% of them, percent of them went to school. Um, and the same person, three years later, writes about Holodomor as a genocide of the Ukrainian people. This is a radical form of changing your orientation as a scholar. And the reason that this happens oftentimes is not because somebody has, you know, just kind of randomly realized that they were wrong their whole time. Oftentimes this happens because there's pressure, right? And in Ukrainian historical studies, there have been kind of three different directions where the pressure has been coming from, right? There's been this Soviet legacy that we've talked about quite a bit. Um, and of course, you know, whoever has it wants to maintain the power and influence that they have within the system. If you're a director of a research institute, you don't wanna be fired. Why would you wanna be fired, right? So you're gonna do whatever you can in order to maintain your influence. Um, there's of course, sometimes a need to change your narrative for that. So you're gonna, you know, some people have done that. Some people have changed whatever they were talking about. But then there are also, of course, those who have truly, you know, themselves believed that there's a need to rejuvenate Ukrainian national project. And those people have very different perspectives. Um, they are attempting to confront the Soviet legacy. They're attempting to confront the legacy of Russification. I don't know if you've heard that word before, but in very simple terms, you know, uh, the, the policies of Kremlin for centuries have been to make Ukrainians speak Russian. Um, and for many people, especially in larger cities, because uh, in urban area, it's easier to homogenize people in a way, um, they had very limited knowledge of Ukrainian. But then, of course, at the same time, you know, there's also keep, uh, this very large Western engagement, right? After the Soviet Union collapsed, in many instances, European countries and North American countries were very interested in engaging with the former Soviet states. In case of Ukraine, oftentimes these were people from the diaspora, right? People who have Ukrainian origins, Ukrainian background, who wanted to engage. Um, so that creates a whole different agenda for some part of the population, people who want to do reforms, people who want to change the way that things are run. And as you could imagine, these three really don't go along together very well, right? There's really a lot of tension between these three things. Um, and some of the tension is exactly along these lines of dogmatic thinking, where things are black and white, and academic freedom, which means that scholars and students should be free to explore different things, right? They should be free to critically examine what is considered to be true. Uh, so who gets to choose the research topics in this context? Um, some of uh, my interviewees uh, have told me that when they were PhD students, when they were trying to pick what is their research gonna be like, their academic advisors would tell them not to research specific topics because they were uh, too politically sensitive, right? Um, and 
that is a certain legacy of self-censorship that people were so used to doing in the Soviet Union. Um, what theoretical and conceptual frameworks are you going to use in your research and teaching, right? That's another question. Who gets to decide on this? Oftentimes, uh, national government was very protective about deciding what gets taught, how it gets taught. And uh, for example, you know, textbooks have been centrally chosen by the Ministry of Education, printed and sent out to schools and universities. Um, this has changed dramatically, of course, after independence. And in history, um, a, a book, a textbook by uh, Professor Subtelny from Canada has become a basic textbook in history in the 90s uh, for major Ukrainian universities. Uh, as you could potentially, you know, uh, figure out from his last name, he's of Ukrainian origin and he's been interested in Ukrainian history for a long time. Um, so uh, when we talk about these issues of methods, of frameworks, of, uh, you know, uh, topics, this is all about whether or not you have academic freedom, but not just academic freedom that is given to you by the institutions, but academic freedom that you give to yourself. Um, unfortunately, that is not always easy, right? I have a different quote for you here um, from a young scholar who has shared how it was so confusing for his supervisors, for his senior colleagues. They were so used to self-censoring that they were constantly trying to figure out what is the state ideology now. What is the new dogma that they need to follow? What is the right narrative for them to talk about it? Um, coming back, for example, to the topic of Holodomor, uh, there's this very interesting debate right now in Ukrainian historical community where some people say that we should be quoting 4 million as a number of victims. And other people say we should be quoting 10 and a half million as a number of victims. Uh, and trust me, they don't get along with each other very well. They have different methodologies that they follow in calculating. So this is one of the challenges for them to figure out because some of the scholars think that the bigger number they put on it, the more important the topic is gonna become, bless you. But when you think about letting yourself have academic freedom, when you make that choice, I, I think it's important to acknowledge that that comes with the responsibility. We call that side of the responsibility oftentimes academic duty. And this is a concept that is not very much talked about. I hope you guys have heard about it, uh, but we obviously often really enjoy talking about our freedoms, not so much about our responsibilities, maybe. Um, because one of the challenges of the Ukrainian historical community um, has been that freedom has been interpreted in the absolute terms. What would that mean? That would mean that uh, if I'm free, nobody can tell me what's right and wrong. If I think that 10 million is a night right number. If you're telling me that's a wrong number, you're violating my academic freedom. And that has created this situation where there are competing narratives that are constantly exist in Ukrainian history. Um, and those are not necessarily always critically examined. Oftentimes they're just left to be there not to interfere with somebody else's academic freedom. But that is, of course, 100% irresponsible, right? Because that means that it's not just a number uh, that may differ. That means that the whole kind of, you know, set of facts and uh, events can be interpreted uh, not just in from different perspectives, uh, but with very different and oftentimes dangerous implications, right? So one of the ways, you know, to give an example of it is about whether or not, you know, you interpret the period of uh, Ukrainian-Russian relationship as this mythical 
unity between Russia and Ukraine, which has been often used um, in uh, Russian government's uh, propaganda, or you, do you interpret that as a form of uh, occupation, colonization? Um, and then if you talk about colonization, you know, uh, what, who who colonized who? That's a very complex discussion in the Ukrainian context because, as a lot of historians um, would argue, Ukrainians themselves have been colonizers because after Russia has taken over, well, after Russian Empire has taken over the lands of the former Ottoman Empire and the Crimean Khanate, uh, many of the Ukrainian peasants have moved from the north to the south in this way, becoming the colonizers themselves. Um, right, so uh, when the freedom is absolute, uh, when there is no academic duty, uh, then uh, there is no way of discussing or no way of really trying to get to the uh, some kind of formulation of what we think is true, because then we're in this kind of reality of, you know, uh, nothing is true as everything is possible, as one famous author has said, right? Um, but uh, when you, um, what encourages people to take that responsibility? One of the things that I found, which I thought was very interesting, is that uh, it was the crisis and the threat to the profession itself that encourages people to take responsibility. And in case of Ukrainian historians, this has happened when uh, several of very high level, uh, several scholars in high level position uh, started saying things that didn't necessarily sound academically ethical. And it turned out that uh, they, their dissertations have been plagiarized. It turned out that uh, those comments could potentially discredit historians as a profession altogether in the Ukrainian context. And this is when the community of Ukrainian historians, so some of them, have come together in order to protect the very legitimacy of their academic profession, right? Um, so it seems that when people's overall careers are on the line, they're able to come together and to take that responsibility for what their field looks like and what is going on um, within their profession. Uh, another existential threat, of course, is this massive disinformation about Ukrainian history that has been coming out of Russia. And uh, as some of the Ukrainian historians have argued, this has changed the role of historians in Ukrainian context altogether. Because historians really turn from being this, uh, you know, very academically focused people who work in the archives and write papers into much more publicly engaged and media savvy personas. Historians now need to talk to the public. Some of them have started their own YouTube channels because the level of Russian disinformation has gotten to the stage where it's become threatening for the overall social order more broadly. Um, and uh, uh, of course, you know, um, that, that that does not just, the word does not just encourage more academic duty, the war also restricts some of the academic freedom. Um, and unfortunately, you know, uh, what we see is that uh, there are some very basic restrictions, which you could probably easily kind of logically figure out, uh, right? So for example, uh, there are travel restrictions to the occupied territories, right? Well, that's not something that people probably want to do on a daily basis, but uh, overall, um, there, it, it is a, quite challenging for Ukrainian historians to get any access to the occupied territories. That means no access to the archives, even where they've been saved. That means limited communications with colleague, their colleagues. Um, but there's also been a, a discussion of introducing more restrictions in Ukraine on using scholarship that has been published in Russia by the Ukrainian historians because this has been seen as a way to reproduce Russian disinformation and Russian propaganda. Um, 
And uh, another issue that we are seeing, which is coming increasingly, you know, um, outside of the political domain, but more from the public domain, is that there are certain dominant narratives in the society. Uh, public has certain opinions about how Ukrainian history is, how Ukrainian history was, and they really don't like being challenged by academics, uh, right? So you can see a quote here about how uh, certain Ukrainian nationalist organizations from the Second World War are perceived as fighters for Ukrainian independence and, you know, fighters against the Soviets. In public, oftentimes, really does not want to hear that any of this have committed any crimes because of the overall overarching positive narrative and the trauma that people are experiencing because of the ongoing war. Um, one of the ways historians have responded to that is through the pro public projects. Um, this is one example of a public engagement project that is run by Ukrainian historians. It's called the League Bes from Russian Likvidatsiya Bez Hramatnosti. Uh, liquidation of illiteracy. It's a very Soviet term. Um, and they publish articles, books. They do a lot of their work in Russian intentionally to be able to reach the other audiences. Um, they lead public lectures. They work with the Ukrainian armed forces and do various youth competitions and reconstructions to make history more interesting, more engaging, to get people to learn more about history. Uh, but the problem with that kind of engagement is that from the perspective of academic profession, it's invisible. Uh, what I have here is a little chart from uh, a research led by the colleagues out of Oxford uh, that shows you uh, how many papers, like how, how the, distri the, distri the percentage distribution of pa papers published by Ukrainian scholars and history is obviously in humanities. And you can see that in humanities, the share of papers is close to zero. And what that means is that means that all of these scholars that we have in Ukraine in humanities are so engaged in public debates and helping the country to face you know, this challenge of Russian disinformation that they really have minimum time to do their actual academic work. Uh, and that translates into the fact that there's very little research output on their end. Of course, some, some of them, you know, publish in Ukrainian, which is invisible to this chart because this is taken from out of web of science. Uh, but more broadly speaking, when historians are put into this position where there's public pressure for them to engage uh, with the society more broadly, uh, they face this tremendous choice they could either do what society expects of them or what their contracts and their bosses expect of them. And those are unfortunately in Ukraine right now, two very different things. Um, I'll leave it at that. And I ask if you guys have any questions or comments or if you wanna you know, share any thoughts. Doing uh, I was part of the presentation in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. uh, I heard the story or the saw a story on the internet about two brothers who went to Poland and then uh, entered in for a chance to enter a program to go to the United States for about two years to finish up high school. Uh, it took them, I think, about two months or so to, um, uh, you know, be drawn in. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's like a long time or do you think that's just like just about right? Uh, I'm honestly, I'm just not very familiar with that context or like, you know, what kind of uh, process that would engage, require. So I don't think I can give you a good answer to that question, I'm afraid. Okay, no worries. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Go ahead. Are, not really experts with they're here, but is that just because of their like the different information that they had access to as they were becoming educated or are there other factors uh, besides like the pressure? Could you clarify that? I'm sorry, I'm not yeah, sure if I got it. I'm not really mm -hmm. sure it. Um, so the professors, they're not experts in the way that you said they are here mm -hmm. because of like all of these mm -hmm. like do you think there's anything like 
do they, is there self-awareness in that where they know that they're doing that? Mm -hmm. There, say there is. So, uh, I guess, you know, uh, the answer is it depends, right? Um, scholarship would argue that uh, oftentimes, you know, people do not see themselves as if they are, you know, lacking qualification in whatever field that they work in. So there is this... Um, colleague researcher out of Estonia who also worked for many years on the reform agenda in the post-Soviet states. And um, his argument is that uh, there's a certain, uh, uh, should I say, uh, coloniality of knowledge coming from the West towards the post-Soviet states. So in the post-Soviet context, we're obviously very different from what, you know, you guys are experiencing. Our universities are very different. The way, you know, information is discussed is very different. The way academics are trained is very different. That disparity uh, has often been interpreted as deficiency. So oftentimes, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, scholars from the West came to the post-Soviet states and thought that, you know, oh, well, your system is just not as good as ours, and you're just not as qualified as we are. Uh, but what researchers really argue is that that's not how faculty in the post-Soviet states see themselves. They don't think that they're not qualified. They really don't think that their way of teaching is deficient, although they still might lecture using the book from the 1957. It's an arbitrary number, you know. Uh, but we still do see those kind of situations where professors who have been in their position for decades, right, um, has uh, the, uh, you know, faculty age overall in Ukraine is quite high up. Um, I can't tell you for the universities, it's obviously depends by the institution. Some scholars have argued that among researchers in the National Academy of Sciences, the average age is 75. And the reason for that is because retirement benefits are very minimum in Ukraine. So scholars choose not to leave their job even after their retirement age. And that essentially leads to this process of having a lot of professors who have been trained during the Soviet Union, uh, who may not necessarily have access to other resources to change their approaches um, to still, you know, teaching what they were teaching or writing what they were writing. Um, that is not the case across the board. Of course, there are a lot of scholars who have taken up the opportunity, you know, um, developed a new research agenda or changed their research agenda and um, done things very differently. But overall, unfortunately, because uh, there is this phenomenon of what we call the culture of mediocrity, where, you know, there's 273 universities in Ukraine right now, I believe. I mean, institutions of higher education, there can be colleges, there can be universities, but, you know, over 273, the admission process is not very competitive. Uh, and uh, the therefore, they're kind of require the teaching requirements and research requirements are not necessarily focused on kind of pursuing excellence and innovation and whatnot. Oftentimes, it's about just uh, survival, right? So um, the university universities have very little funding, so they're just trying to get by. Okay. I just have one more question. So I'm doing a project on um, Russian uh, secret police, basically, uh, uh, information by, you know, preventing scholars from like writing and whatnot back in the USSR. Do you have any sources that you could recommend me or just anything that you want to promote instead of just, you know, typing that in Google? <laughs> library. So I think that, uh, you know, there are a lot of interesting works that you can look into. Um, uh, from um, the organized kind of, you know, 
organizational perspective, you might want to look at the work of Alex Kuraev. Uh, he has written extensively about uh, the experiences of Russian scholars in the Soviet Union. And uh, he has written about the process of getting something approved to be published, right? How did it work with the unit one? Um, this is the, you know, this, the secret service inside of the universities, how did the whole process of getting things out looked like. Um, but I think that you might, you know, uh, also want to look into some other things. I won't be able to tell you exact offers, but I think one of the interesting phenomena with, that we are seeing in this, you know, very strange space <laughs> of uh, former Soviet Union is that um, there is really a lot of unofficial things that are much better quality than the official things, right? So, for example, during the Soviet Union, one of the things that was very uh, uh, interesting was a so-called sum is that, uh, which means self-published. So basically things that couldn't be cleared, the things that have been censored, um, have been published illegally and then copied and shared across the scholarly community. So some of those things, uh, you know, may be interesting in order to look into the things that are and how things got out, even though, you know, they might have not been allowed to get out in the official way. So would you say is a solution for the irresponsibility of people who, as you explained, have exact fiction? So this is a this is a very hard question. <laughs> um, I think that uh, you know we uh, as uh, students and researchers can help the to understand this much better because this is one of the things that hasn't really been talked about a lot. All right. Um, the overall idea of not taking responsibility is very popular in the former Soviet states for one very simple reason, uh, because the way the Soviet machinery worked, people were punished for their actions that did not align with whatever, you know, the uh, Communist Party policy was at any given time. So that kind of you know, translates into this uh, undecisiveness or this lack of the ability to take responsibility. Um, but it, it's not necessarily something that can be easily fixed, right? So uh, one of the things that could be addressed is of course, you know, uh, how the overall academic system is regulated, for example, um, right? Um, so these days, for example, you know, there are still processes that academics have to go through in order to get their uh, syllabus approved, in order to get their program plans approved. These are often still very prescriptive, very kind of Soviet style prescriptive things, um, which gives faculty very little space for that responsibility to begin with. Um, right, so one of the things that could be done is creating more of that space for responsibility um, and creating more of that space for horizontal engagement where, for example, uh, syllabus are reviewed by other faculty members versus by somebody who is, you know, their boss, right? Um, so uh, that could be one route to take. Another route to take could be, of course, thinking about ways that could uh, build further capacity for responsibility. Uh, in other words, uh, create an uh, environment where the people would be, will need to take responsibility, right? So uh, for example, one of the things that is being done right now uh, is this transition um, from so-called um, uh, I'm gonna try and put in simple terms. So, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, so for example, uh, this, the way that the Soviet system controlled who gets to be a researcher and who doesn't, um, which was still in place in Ukraine for a couple of decades, uh, was that there were fixed committees of 20-ish people who would be so-called responsible for deciding whether or not this or somebody's dissertation is of a good quality. What happens when you have a fixed committee of 20 people is that they cannot be all experts 
in whatever research topic that person is writing on. And those 20 people are not going to read the dissertation with the same level of accuracy. So you automatically put them in the position where some of them are responsibly going to do their job and others are just going to be free writers because they know that somebody else is going to read that work. And the way that Ukrainian government, for example, is trying to fix that is by saying, no, we're going to move into this very Western kind model where you're going to have five people on your committee that those people are going to be experts in your field and they're all going to be required to read your work. Right. So they're intentionally putting the scholars in this position where they're supposed to take responsibility in a way. Right. And I suppose, you know, over time, that could be one of the ways that that could pick up, I hope. Yeah. So you said that you um, have done, you know, lots of work for um, academia in Ukraine. What would you say is the thing you're most proud of that you've done to uh, help, uh, you know, move forward academia in Ukraine? Uh, well, I think um, it's a hard question for me to ask because I don't have an appropriate distance. <laughs> Uh, I mean, time distance, you know, but from what it looks like right now, um, one of the things that I think has made the most um, impact uh, was uh, my efforts to help introduce virtual exchanges and collaborative online international learning to Ukrainian academia. To put it simply, uh, it's the idea that you don't have to pack your bag and go abroad to have an international experience and to get involved with somebody who has a different perspective. Um, I started uh, doing it when I worked for um, American Councils for International Education. We've started doing training programs to train Ukrainian faculty to build partnership with their uh, colleagues abroad and to sync their courses with the courses of their colleagues abroad in a way that the students in two different classrooms, in two different countries, can have joint projects or joint discussions, and that way get a little bit of a broader perspective on things. Um, that helped a lot during COVID, because as you can imagine, nobody will travel anywhere, uh, especially in Europe, because uh, they were very cautious about it. And uh, that has helped a lot during the full-scale invasion, because uh, Male students and male faculty, as you may have heard, cannot leave the country oftentimes because of the martial law in Ukraine. So for our male students in particular, that is right now probably the most uh, efficient way to get some sort of exposure internationally. Um, and I think it matters because it exactly helps to challenge that kind of dogmatism, that binary thinking, you know, that idea that the world is black and white because um, it's much harder uh, to be prejudiced against somebody uh, different when you met them, when you talk to them, and when you collaborated with them. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Two questions, Liz. Mm -hmm. Do you want them both at the same time? Whatever you I'm think really is best. <laughs> but, well, the first one is a question for your presentation. Mm -hmm. the, the area where you talked about licks, uh, again, that Soviet style, um, mm -hmm. the Ukrainian scholars now are borrowing that to get information out. Mm -hmm. uh, Lick best. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned briefly that that they're also trying to reach the Russian speaking, the Russian mm -hmm. audience. So it's not just getting the the right information to Ukraine, to their own citizenry, but also to the Russian citizenry. Is that correct? So I, I'm afraid I'm not sure they want to reach Russian audience. They want to reach Russian speaking audience. Oh, okay. That's how they frame it. You know, it doesn't limit it to just Russian speaking Ukrainian audience. Yeah. I think that they've been uh, intending to make it a little bit broader. Because when you say Russian speaking, that pretty much includes everybody, you know, who used to be a part of the Soviet Union. So the question is, I mean, that changes it a little bit, but maybe <laughs> I can still ask the same question. Is what is the risk of that becoming propaganda? Um, mm -hmm. Particularly with people who have had 
you know, been under a system of propaganda for, for so that mm -hmm. it's so deep embedded in in the way they know the world, even if they are trying not to operate. Yep. Yep. Uh, the risk, I mean, the risk of that becoming, I mean, they call it the risk of becoming it counter propaganda, right? Which is just a fancy way of saying we are at risk of creating propaganda of our own. And um, there is a very wide spectrum of thoughts on this matter, I'm afraid. Um, it's, it, I, I I doubt that Ukrainian historians will ever reach any kind of consensus around this issue, which may be a good thing because, you know, as long as debates are going, people kind of keep themselves in check. Uh, some um, some scholars argue that this is counter-propaganda already, that this is political, that this is not scholarship, and that historians should not engage in it. Others has argued that not engaging in addressing, um, you know, uh, Russian messages is irresponsible. It's cr about creating an ivory tower, pretending that academics are not related to the society where they belong, um, and considering that much of the, you know, Ukrainian higher education is used to be funded from the uh, public. Uh, money, right, from the state budget, uh, a lot of scholars of course, made an argument that if you only do your academic research, if you don't give back to the society, that why on earth are you even being funded by the state? Uh, so there's the, the two polarizing views, and there's everything in between, pretty much, um, with people saying that they experience pressure sometimes. Uh, they sometimes, you know, get messages from their leadership and their institutions uh, that some topics or some messages might have, you know, need to be formulated in a very specific way or some topics might need to be dealt with. Uh, they're conscious, they're trying to be reflective, they're trying to be self-aware uh, to avoid just creating a different kind of propaganda. Is it entirely possible? I don't think so. I think that a lot of this discussions and, you know, tensions that we see right now um, show that it's it, it's not possible, right? So one of the very recent examples, for example, uh, was that when um, you may have seen this, Ukraine's president Zelensky went to the Canadian parliament and he gave a speech at the Canadian parliament, which resulted in a very, very big public discussion in Canada because one of the guests invited to that um, meeting in the parliament was um, a warrior in the uh, Waffen SS Galicia division. Uh, and um, he is ethnically Ukrainian, obviously. Um, that was uh, a Ukrainian uh, SS division has, that has been formed by the Nazis. Uh, and uh, of course, many people saw this as um, a sort of indirect support of uh, Nazism and anti-Semitism, uh, and they demanded that this has, you know, has to be, people have to apologize. I think Canadian Speaker of the Parliament eventually resigned, but this has not gone that easily in Ukraine. In Ukraine, this has caused a lot of public discussions about, you know, that legacy of World War II and what has and what hasn't been done. And unfortunately, some scholars who were uh, courageous to, you know, put forward a more nuanced perspective. I would call it a more nuanced perspective because, you know, it's a complex topic. There is decision about Waffen SS by the Nuremberg Tribunal. It, this, this decision does not imply every single member of that particular division is responsible for the um, Holocaust. But that nuanced kind of perspective, unfortunately, is not always welcome. So some historians have taken that as an opportunity to attack that particular individual researcher uh, to attack her publicly, you know, on mass media, in social media. So there's obviously this tension and um, kind of danger, as you mentioned, of, you know, people, uh, professional academics becoming sort of um, propagandists of a certain perspective. Yeah. Number two, I'm shifting my second question. So it's a little more related. As someone who grew up, me and you, as someone who grew up in a state that was at least had the 
tentacles of propaganda mm -hmm. built into it's a battle. And for those of us here who are living in a, uh, a culture now that, that's, as you mentioned, there's so much conversation on propaganda and disinformation, and it becoming a factor of life here. What's your advice for how to how to manage that, how to combat that, how mm -hmm. to not succumb to this? Um. I don't know if it's an entirely in advice, but I can tell you what I do. Every single time uh, when I catch myself thinking that something is simple, I try to take a 10 seconds pause <laughs> uh, and think how it could be so much more nuanced and complicated than I actually think it is. Because, um, we, you know, tend to prefer for things to be simple and clear and logical and well explainable uh, in very simple terms, preferably, right? Uh, you know, uh, like 15 seconds uh, Instagram video or something, that would be an ideal format, right? <laughs> Um, the sad reality is the world doesn't work that way. The sad reality is there's always nuance. There's always uh, more to the situation than what we can see because our perspective is limited. So if we are able to step, take a step back to give ourselves time uh, to look into what a different perspective might look like, right? Um, that usually helps me, right? Uh, and uh, I don't know if, it helps everybody, but I feel like, you know, uh, this is uh, something that I've learned to do over the time because uh, I haven't mentioned it, but um, I honestly don't even know how many history books have changed when I went through school. I went, you know, I started school in 1997 and I completed school um, in 2007. So after the orange revolution that has been mentioned before, for example, uh, and you know that that the whole kind of understanding of history and things as they are have been changed several times during that period alone. Not even to talk about you know um, what I then studied in college and et cetera, et cetera. So um, I just think that you know the world is nuanced. The world is complicated. And if we don't, if we don't want to be victims to disinformation, we have to accept that and stop looking for the simple answers and simple solutions. Unless, of course, you know you're looking for an instruction to an air fryer, then it's somewhere right there. <laughs> well, thank you, Liz, for being here and sharing all this uh, information. And so thank you for having me. Yeah. yeah.